Hey everybody, welcome to another installment of BG on TV. I'm your host, Dylan Stretchberry. Striking. 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 And welcome to the happy tummy. I am BG. Striking. I am BG. Striking. I am BG. Striking. Strive for perfection, accept reality. Hey everybody, welcome to another installment of BG on TV. I'm your host, Dylan Stretchberry. We're shooting on location on the roof of the Physical Science Building and we have an action-packed episode for you today. First, we'll be continuing our journey with Henry with a new episode of The Ugly People. Then, Justin Grubb will be giving us some insight into the Marine Biology Department. After that, our very own David Hardgrove will be trying to challenge some of the members of the volleyball team. Then we'll talk to Dr. Ladd and he'll tell us everything we need to know about the observatory and planetarium here on campus. Finally, we'll check in with former host of BG on TV, Debbie Alderman, as she tries to attempt a rock climbing adventure. Stay tuned, you won't want to miss it. Previously on The Ugly People. Move on with our lives and see other people. I should have known better, because you're selfish and you're a pig. <coughs> Since you'd obviously forgotten about Valentine's Day, which is assuming you don't already have someone lined up. You're ugly, Henry. You're ugly on the inside, and I just want you to remember that. So, are you going to Tommy's party next weekend? No. Who do I even talk to? Okay, I'll be there, and I'll stick around and you can talk to me. And Henry will be there. You know Henry. Come on, it's a Halloween party. And I don't even have a costume. What are you wearing? I'm wearing a costume. Here, I'll, but I'll show you. Costume party. Yeah. You wanna see it? Ugh, Sydney, what's taking you so long? Did you fall in the toilet? Oh my gosh. Like? No. The guy is gonna be so after you. What else is he? And if you go, we might find you a nice spot. Come on, let's take a picture. But yeah, you look good. October 31st. This is my 62nd entry, and by now I have reached the requirement for my journalism class and could have stopped writing these, but the habit has stuck with me. I shouldn't complain about my life right now, but if I'm going to complain, I would rather do it here than on the internet. My grades are decent in school, there's a bed I can sleep in every night. My wages aren't huge, but my budget is for a single meal, so my biggest expense would be food. The only trouble I have is how to end my lame duck relationship. I know it's over with her, I just don't think she does. It would be much less painful if only I could sever ties with her, but I can't. The moment you get something is the moment you stop wanting it. I wish I could be like those people who are satisfied with what they have, but I'll never be satisfied with what I have, because I want everything. That's the thrill with doubling down. You see how much you can actually get, but then when you get it, the question gets brought up. Can I do better than her? I don't know if I can get someone prettier than her, but that's not important. I know I can be a better man without her. When she looks at me, she sees the man I am, not the man I want to be. I need to wipe the slate clean. Well, I guess I live here now. You should probably start getting your mail sent here, just to make it official. Yeah. You know, it's just crazy thinking that we're going to be sharing a closet, a bathroom and a bed together. And a washing machine. Speaking of, you need to find something nice to wear for Christmas dinner next week. Please make sure it's clean. Cool. Dinner at home. Who's cooking, me or you? You know we're going to my parents' place. It's non-negotiable. All my clothes are kind of dirty, so... I should probably get started on that. Don't expect me to do all your dishes and laundry all the time. I'm not your mother. And besides, you already promised you'd go, so don't start with those shenanigans. And I mean, we do live together now. It is kind of expected of us. Stop. I really like you, and... I just don't want this to turn into something that's all about that. Is that all you see me as? <laughs> no. Someone who's only interested in that? I mean, it would have gone through a lot of trouble just for that. And you know, we do live together, so it is kind of expected. Yeah, but I'll wait as long as you need. 
Seriously though, are you scared or something? This is so fresh. <laughs> See? That wasn't so bad. Don't make fun of me. I can't believe I gave in so easy. You think you gave in so easy? I've never had to wait that long for a girl, ever. But it's okay. I know my charm is irresistible. It's impossible how full of yourself you are. By the way, how many girls didn't make you wait? Please. A gentleman never tells. Do you think this is moving too fast? I mean, it's only been about a month. No. I don't think so. Especially since we've known each other for so long before we started going together. I mean, it makes it feel instinctive. But seriously, I... I can't thank you enough for letting me move in here. I I needed to get out of that house. It was it's getting out of control. Yeah, you did need to get out of there, and I'll be the first to say it. But there is one thing we need to talk about. Yeah? What's that? That beard has got to go. No Shave November was last month, and you can't meet my parents looking like Paul Bunyan. I think it looks pretty good. So no, the beard is a non-negotiable. Ew, untag that one. Do you see that pimple? It's gross. Why is that one still up there? Come on. You know why I like taking pictures of Scarlett? Because she makes me look so much prettier. Oh, is that bad? Oh, hey, Sydney. I didn't know you were taking American History 3120. Oh, hey, Scarlett. We must be in different sections. How are you feeling about the test? All confident as usual. What about you? Oh, I feel great. Did you make sure to study up on Benedict and Arnold? No, he's Benedict Arnold. Well, if you don't know now, then it's too late. But good luck. Ready for the test? A few years ago, the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium started an aquaculture project with peppermint shrimp. The shrimp were used to naturally maintain algae and aptasia in the show aquariums. However, this project ended up becoming a stepping stone for an even larger conservation project with fish aquaculture. Hey, I'm here with Ramon Villaverde, the senior aquarist at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, and he's here to talk to us about a really cool marine conservation project. So, what is the project about? Uh, the project's called Rising Tide, and it's an initiative uh, with researchers and several AZA institutions to be able to uh, aquaculture marine fish. So how do you collect the fish eggs from the aquarium? Uh, we collect the fish eggs from the surface of the aquarium uh, with the special made collection uh, baskets. The eggs float to the surface, and these the, uh, egg collection baskets skim that sur surface of the water and draw in the eggs and they get collected overnight. Okay, so what do you guys do with the eggs once you collect them? Uh, once we get collect the eggs, we clean them up, separate the viable eggs from the bad eggs and the detritus and waste material that we also collect in the collectors. And then we pack them up and then we ship them down to the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Laboratories. Okay, so what do they do with the fish once they're raised? Uh, right now, they're still developing techniques on, on raising the larval fish because they're really difficult to uh, raise. It's really difficult to raise marine fish because they're so small. They have been able to raise some angel fish, some silver moonies, and late stages of some other fish in the, in, in the aquarium. Uh, they will be sending some of those fish that they've been successful at back to us and we'll keep them here for a while and possibly we might surplus them out to other institutions. Okay, so what is the overall goal of doing this breeding project? The overall goal of the project is to be able to aquaculture marine fish economically and be more sustainable and, ha and avoid collecting wild fish. So how do you like your experiences working with uh, students from Bowling Green? My experience with students at Bowling Green has been enjoyable. Uh, I've collaborated with you a lot on setting several different aquaculture systems up with you and I've had several students that have been interns here 
and it's great that they continue their interest in the marine field. The Columbus Zoo and Aquarium Peppermint Shrimp Project was brought over to the Marine Lab at BGSU by interns from Discovery Reef. Hey, I'm at the Bowling Green State University Marine Lab and this is the Peppermint Shrimp Project. Now the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium helped me a lot in setting this thing up properly. This is the adult aquarium where the adults breed and this is the larvae aquarium. What we do with the peppermint shrimp after they develop into adults is we put them into the coral tanks and there they add to the biodiversity of the tank and they're also considered cleaner shrimp and they clean up waste and aptasia. But another thing we're using these peppermint shrimp for is to artificially cultivate live rock. And to find out more about that project, we're gonna go talk to the head coordinator of the Marine Lab. So this is Eric Carlson, the head coordinator of the Marine Lab, and one of the guys working on the cultivation of live rock. So Eric, what is live rock? That's a very good question, and I have an example right here. No, people never think of rock as a living thing, but this is what we would have an example of a small piece of live rock. Where rock lives in the ocean, you have actually a lot of things growing on the rock as different algaes, corals that are budding up. Um, there's a lot of microbes and even invertebrates that live in and around the rock. So when this rock gets all this kind of growth and life living on it, it's what we call live rock. It's very good for the ecosystem. It's found on many coral reefs. So what does adding peppermint shrimp to the live rock do? Uh, well, here we're working on a live rock project. We're trying to cultivate live rock. Um, and in cultivating live rock, we're taking both pieces of live rock in a tank and dead rock into a tank so we can try to make that dead rock have living things on it. Having peppermint shrimp in the tank actually helps uh, create a better ecosystem, has great bi biodiversity, and actually cleans up a lot of the rocks and stuff that we don't want that's trying to move around and live in that tank. Okay, so what's the goal of this project? I mean, why, does it, why is it sustainable? Um, that's a great question also. Uh, the, the point of this, uh, the great part of this project is live rock, as I said, really, likes, uh, really lives in uh, coral reefs. Lots of corals live off rocks like that you can see on here. Uh, and when that happens, um, people love having live rock in their tanks for aquarists at home or in labs. Um, and the, usually the most way people get it is by destroying coral reefs. If we, can if we can find the best way to cultivate our own live rock in this lab, we can do so by taking our old piece of live rock that has plenty of living things on it and take dead rock that we have and just move it over in our own tanks without actually having to go take things out of the ocean, keeping it a good, healthy ecosystem without destroying anything that's there. Yeah, so that sounds great. Just doing their part to make sure the ocean stay healthy and stay alive. So as you can see, both the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium and the Bowling Green State University Marine Lab are working together to promote conservation and sustainability. Both projects started from the same source, the Peppermint Shrimp Aquaculture Project. Ventures like these are vital to the ocean's success and help reduce the impact we have as humans. I hope you enjoyed our adventure here and I'll catch you next time on my wild adventures. Welcome to the first edition of One on One with Dave Hargrove. I'm your host, Dave Hargrove. With me today is sophomore sensation Laura Avila, and um, she is the starting setter for the Bowling Green volleyball team. Why did you pick Bowling Green State University? I chose Bowling Green because I decided early on I wanted to stay close to home so that my family could watch me play. Um, and when I got on campus, I really liked the college town atmosphere. Um, I was really sold um, on the team, and I liked the atmosphere in the weight room. And a little fact, Denise Vandewally played for Ball State at the same time that my dad played on the men's team at Ball State. So they knew each other. Now I understand that recently you guys hired a new head coach for the volleyball team. How do you feel that has affected your, uh, the chemistry on your team and what do you think she brings to the table? Um, I think that team chemistry wise, we're still the same team, but um, she definitely brings a new vision to the program. Uh, she has new technique for us, which um, is just a learning process. She's been patient with us and we've really enjoyed her um, intensity and how straightforward she is with us. Um, but we're looking forward to the future and I think that we're excited about where she wants to take us. All right, and on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest, how much better do you think you are than me at volleyball? I'd say about 25. Well, if you're so confident, how about we put your skills to the test with the first one-on-one -on -one challenge? All right, for today's challenge, we're gonna put Laura's setting skills to the test. We're each gonna have 10 attempts to see who can make the most volleyballs from this basket right here 
into that basket over there. Let's start this competition. Okay, so I know you're an eighth grade champ, but I still want to refresh your memory on how to set the ball. So basically, you want to make a window with your fingers, and you want to put the logo of the ball right between it. It's easiest if you put the logo there. And you want to hold it like a two liter of pop. And you raise it above your forehead, and you extend your hands evenly. Yeah, you gave it your best shot. Yeah, but my best just wasn't good enough. I guess eighth grade is just not quite as good as uh, collegiate athletes. Yeah, you were an eighth grade champ to collegiate chump. Thanks, Laura. I needed that right now. <laughs> no uh, problem. Well, anyways, we should probably get out of here. Thanks for uh, coming on today. Yeah, no problem. All right. Guys, I'm standing here with Dr. Layton, Associate Professor of Astronomy and the Director of the Observatory here on campus. Uh, Dr. Layton, for those who aren't familiar with the observatory, what exactly uh, is it? <laughs> well, we've got a, a rooftop location here on the top of the PSLB building, the Physical Sciences Lab building. Uh, so we've got some space for small telescopes that we can set up. Uh, we've got some space for people just to look at the sky. And most importantly, behind us, we've got a half meter telescope in that big white dome that we can use to, to look at uh, fainter objects in the sky. So you add, is the observance more for students or is anybody welcome to participate? It's kind of a mixture. Um, the, the primary goal, I think, is to get uh, all the students from our introductory astronomy classes to visit the observatory and see the sky once during the term. So that's about 800 students. But we also have three or four public shows each night or each week uh, where um, we have a planetarium show downstairs and then if it's clear we'll bring people up to the roof and they can look through the telescopes as well. And you were just talking about the planetarium um, and that's different from what this is then? Yes, yes. The planetarium's down at ground level. It's the big dome in front of okay. PSLB and it's basically got a, a projector that projects images of stars onto a dome so that you can see the sky, sort of, even if it's cloudy or raining outside. Well, that's really cool. And, and do you guys just show that in the in the planetarium? Are there other other things that you guys display in there? That's a good question. We have uh, we have multimedia shows that involve slides, music, some video, uh, but the background or the basis is always something astronomical, and it's always got the star projectors, star field. That's as part of the show. And uh, what kind of technology goes into to running something like that? Well, it's maybe a little surprising. The the Planetarium star projector is almost 30 years old now, oh, wow. um, and so it's getting a little dated, and we're worried a little bit that it's getting harder to find spare parts and things like that. Great, and, and you guys sort of reach out beyond campus. Um, uh, as I understand, uh, local schools will come here, and, and even it's just open up to the community for some shows. That's right, that's right. Uh, the uh, director of the planetarium, Dr. Smith, uh, usually uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays hosts one or two school groups mm -hmm. coming from the local uh, K through 12 schools. Uh, and then three or four nights a week he has open nights. Mostly it's people from Bowling Green okay. community and, and surroundings. Wow. And, and what kind of crowd uh, usually uh, attracts from the observatory then? 
up here? Um, I think if it's clear, most of the time, everybody who's at the planetarium show will come upstairs and, and enjoy the sky as well. Oh, well, great. Um, what, are, what are some things that people should know about the observatory that they might not uh, already know about? Well, um, our, our half meter telescope, 20 inches in diameter, one of the largest telescopes in Ohio. Okay. The University of Toledo beats us by a little bit, but we're in a much nicer situation. Yeah. They're in downtown Toledo. It's very hard to see anything with, with, with the lights. The city lights, yeah. exactly. Uh, so I like to think us as having one of the best viewing telescopes in the, in the state. That's so great. another good reason to come by. Yeah. And, and what's, it, what's it look like inside the planet? Um, it's, it's a large round building with a dome-shaped ceiling. The projector sits in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of dominates the room. It's this neat uh, system of, of wires and lenses and things like that, and it moves around. Um, so it's a really nice centerpiece, and I encourage anybody who hasn't been to the planetarium to visit just to sort of see the ambiance as well as to see the show. Well, something like that has to cost a penny or two, huh, to get in? Not very much, actually nothing. Oh, um, wow. Okay. As, as a student, coming as part of a class, it's free. Uh, if you're coming to the evening shows, we suggest or request that you make a dollar donation, wow. but that's optional, and as students, we understand if the dollar hurts. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, we'd mostly want to have your present there. And out, it's a neat opportunity to, to see the sky, and it's a neat facility, and I, I hope everybody takes the time to take advantage of it. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Layden. Thank you, Grant. I'm Jerome Gabriel and I'm the Assistant Director of Recreation and Wellness for the Outdoor Program. The Outdoor Program is a part of the Department of Recreation and Wellness. Uh, we provide outdoor trips across the Midwest as well as running the climbing wall and doing team building for campus. Uh, the rock wall was built in 2003. It's a little over a thousand square feet. It was built for a cost of about $80,000. At the time, it was one of the first rock walls in uh, the state of Ohio to be used at a collegiate campus. Here at the wall, we do a lot of just indoor climbing recreationally for most of our students, as well as running our annual climbing competition that you see behind me. And we run an adrenaline youth climbing club. So we teach youth ages eight to 18 how to rock climb. Rock climbing is just a fun sport. It's a low impact activity compared to a lot of other workouts. Uh, as has been mentioned before, you can burn up to 800 calories an hour rock climbing, and that gives you a really good workout coming in here. A lot of people who maybe don't like running on treadmills or lifting weights, this is a great alternative workout for them. And for the competitors here, I just recommend that they have fun. Uh, that's the biggest part about climbing, even though it's a good workout and there's a lot of you know, physical stress that comes with it, it's a pretty laid back social environment. So you get to meet a lot of great people and have fun doing it. My name is John Whipple. I'm the BGSU Outdoor Program Staff Assistant. So we just finished the second round of our bouldering, uh, bouldering competition. We have uh, four different categories. We've got beginner men's, intermediate men's, and advanced men's. Then we also have a women's category. There's a brown line that's across the wall. It's about 12 feet up. Uh, bouldering is going up to that point. 
but more than not, it's going uh, kind of sideways or laterally across the wall. It's doing really technical moves and not a lot of distance. Compared to top roping where you're going all the way up the wall and you're kind of sustaining those technical moves. After we finish all four rounds of bouldering, we go to our top roping. You can come in, you can do a tri climb, it's only three bucks. And you come in and we get you filled out with a waiver form. We'll give you a harness, shoes, instructions, help lay up the wall, give you give the whole the whole tour of the wall, how to climb and everything. And you can also buy a semester long pass or a year long pass as well to climb. So there's a couple different options for students. Be sure to check out the Rock Wall at the BGSE Rec Center, and for more information, check out the website below. That's all the time we have for today. I'm going to go take a shower. Thanks for hanging around.